Hey class, here we are again at the American Museum of Natural History in one of my favorite places, the Hall of Vertebrates. And this is actually one of my favorite fossil fishes. This is Vactinus, which is a uh, ray fin fish known as the Actinopterygian group of fishes. The fins actually have these protruding rays in them. We're starting here with this beautiful specimen of a fish, a ray fin fish, but we're actually going to go back in time a little bit. And it was fishes, the massive diversity of fishes that define all vertebrates. They were the first group of vertebrates. And today, fishes are actually uh, at the most speciose group uh, in terms of, there are over 31,000 species of fishes. But in the evolution of vertebrates, what's very important to understand is there are four main characteristics that define the entire vertebrate group or the chordates, known as the chordates. Those four major synapomorphies that define all vertebrates in their body plans are pharyngeal gill slits, which occur in the gill region like we see in modern fishes, a dorsal hollow nerve tube that goes over the top of the vertebrae, and a notochord, which is what the vertebrae eventually evolved into. A notochord was the first cartilaginous stiffened element that gave the body its structure. The final last thing that defines the entire vertebrate group is what's called a post-anal tail, a tail fin area that occurs after the anus. Um, and those are the four main characters that define all vertebrate groups. Pharyngeal bass or pharyngeal gill slits, a dorsal hollow nerve tooth, a notochord, and a post-anal tail. Okay, so we just covered the four basic body plans of the vertebrate group, and now we're going to move on to how actually fishes evolved. Now, the first groups of fishes were known as ostracoderms. They were actually jawless fishes. They did not have an articulated jaw, but they were armored with bony plates to protect them from predators, although they didn't really have any other predators in the ocean um, that were at least vertebrates. So being some of the first vertebrates, they didn't have any jaws. They were very likely filter feeders that would suck in um, food particles that they would then um, filter out through their pharyngeal gill slits in that branchial basket area that allowed them to consume food. Here is a basic body plan of an ostracoderm. You see it has a terminal hole where water would be sucked in, but it did not have an articulated set of jaws. Now, as we got to the more advanced astracoderms, which were the first jawless uh, fishes, we see this cephalapsids. These cephalapsids were unique in that they were becoming more and more modified towards uh, active swimming. They had a paired set of pectoral fins. The pectoral fins are in the front part of the body, which actually uh, eventually evolve into our limbs. And they had a more shark-like heterocircle tail, where the upper lobe is longer than the bottom lobe of that tail. And that made for more effective uh, swimming capabilities. Okay, so we know all the four main uh, synapomorphies that define the vertebrate group. And we know ostracoderms were the first sets of fishes, jawless fishes. So what does that mean? Well, actually, one of the first major evolutionary steps that we see in vertebrates is the evolution of jaws. Now, a jaw, what we see like in the shark jaws you just saw above your head, are actually a um, modified set of arch elements, the mandibular arch elements, in the front of the skull. Now, all animals, all vertebrates that have jaws are, are what we call nathostomes. Unlike the ostracoderms, which are known as agnathans, A meaning without, natha meaning jaw, these are actually all the subsequent fishes that evolved, that evolved jaws, are known as nathostomes. Well, what did, what, why would you evolve jaws? Jaws are very important because they allowed them to become much more active predators. Those jaws allow them to grasp very elusive prey, large prey. The biting ability of attaching jaws to a mobile, uh, attaching muscles to a mobile jaw allows them to bite chunks out of their prey. So it made for much more effective predators like we see in the Cucaridon megalodon uh, set of jaws above, uh, up above here. Now, all sharks, rays, and bony fishes actually have articulated set of jaws that they use for prey capture and prey consumption. It's one of the most important, actually, evolutionary steps in vertebrates.
So now we've heard that jaws are one of the first major evolutionary steps in vertebrates, that ability to grasp and consume and capture prey with muscularized, articulating sets of jaws, which are made up of the mandibular arch, the first set of the, of the, the, first set of arches of the branchial basket. We're going to get into that more in detail when I get back to Egypt next week. But what I wanted to show you was some really cool specimens of the first group of jawed fishes known as the placoderms. We just saw Dunkleosteus up above us, which was the largest placoderm of the Devonian period, which was approximately 360 million years ago. They rained the oceans for about 50 million years. They got over 16 feet long, up to 20, uh, 20 feet long. Just tremendous fishes. But the really neat thing about them, here's the actual fossil of their skull is they had this huge articulated jaw which was like a pair of garden shears that could shear past each other and chunk, uh, bite fish in half or bite other prey items right in half. Very powerful jaws and they were incredibly armored, effective predator, one of the most uh, awesome fishes of that Devonian period. Okay, so we've seen the first jawless fishes, the ostracoderms, and the first jawed group of fishes, the placoderms. What was interesting about them is they had these huge armored bony plates that protected their skins. So bone evolved very early on in vertebrates. Um, however, both those groups went extinct. And one of the first groups that still is in existence today is known as the chondrichthians. The chondrichthians actually are a group that contain all the sharks, rays, and rabbit fishes, or rat fishes, uh, that still exist today, even some groups that are actually extinct. And what's unique about the chondrichthians, they're called the cartilaginous fishes. But in fact, what they have is a set of prismatic endoskeletal calcification in this uh, cartilaginous skeleton. So they don't actually have true bone that makes up their vertebrae or any of their fin or jaw elements. The only, el the only enamel that you find in the sharks and rays are actually in their teeth, which is a very unique character. All right, class, so we just learned about the chondrichthian fishes, which are those cartilaginous fishes that make up the sharks, uh, rays, and chimeras. Uh, the other largest group of fishes are known as the osteichthians. The osteichthians means bony fishes. And one of my favorite bony fishes, of course, which we saw a little bit earlier, is the vactinus. Uh, one of the largest groupings of bony fishes are what we call the actinopterygians. Actinopterygian means rayfin fishes. The rayfin fishes include sturgeons, paddlefishes, bowfins, gars, and the modern teleos, which is what your professor particularly likes, because that's what he likes to go fishing for. Now, what does it mean to be a rayfin fish? Well, the synapomorphy that actually come, uh, brings together the entire group of actinopterygian are these bony elements, these small bony elements, uh, 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 basopterygian elements on the pectoral girdle that then extend into these very soft flexible rays and that's what actually makes up the shape of the fin. Now in some fishes in later life you actually have this become a very stiffened element like we see in the fossilized evactinus. Now many of the early raven fishes how they were actually first categorized is because some of the fossilization showed how these leptodotrichia or which are known as rays were actually invested into the different fin areas. All right, class, now we just learned about ray fin fishes, and we talked about their pectoral fins, which had those soft, flexible rays and those bony elements that attached it to the actual pectoral girdle, right? Now, one of the other major evolutionary events in vertebrate history is the evolution of limbs, actual four limbs, tetrapods. We have four limbs, two arms and two legs. That's why we're called the tetrapods. And the evolution of the limbs is a major, major event in vertebrate history, evolutionary history. And it's actually those fin areas that we see in fishes, the pectoral fins and the pelvic girdle region, that actually evolved in later vertebrate groups into our actually mobile limbs. And we're going to talk a lot about this semester, how that sequence occurred, because what we're going to be doing in particular in dissections in the lab and in the lectures when I get back is talking about how those bony elements of a fish's fin eventually evolved into the major bones of the arms and legs. What we call those are actually homologies. We're able to trace those bones, changes in morphology, which is the position and shape through evolutionary time to the evolution of an arm or a leg, as it were, from a fish's fin.